One of the reasons we were interested in, in collaborating with Human Rights Watch was to make transparent what I think is a, a fact well known to many journalists, but perhaps not so well known to, to, to uh, newspaper, magazine, uh, readers and viewers of television, that when you see stories that, that are in these extremely remote uh, regions, it's in the, in the journalist, as, as Mark has pointed out, uh, often their organizations don't have the resources for weeks and weeks of, of field research to get to the places. And so they, they work closely with groups like HRW to get there. And, and, and we think that that work is important. And we thought it was, it was good to, to lay that out in the open, that we were working together to get this story out. I mentioned that this is the first collaboration that the Pulitzer Center has done with Human Rights Watch, uh, which we're very proud of. It's also the first uh, collaboration we've done with Human Rights Watch where one of the Human Rights Watch researchers is also my daughter, and something that I'm also very proud of. Ida Sawyer uh, has been with Human Rights Watch for three years in Eastern Congo, but uh, our family has been hearing a lot about the Lord's Resistance Army for the past six years because of the, the work that Ida began doing uh, six years ago when she was an undergraduate at Columbia uh, in the summers in northern Uganda working in Gulu in the displaced persons camps uh, over the course of three summers with people who were victims of the LRA. And then uh, she went to work in Congo and, and, and over time the LRA came close to the region that, in which she was working. Uh, she and Annika uh, have, have been documenting, uh, this is what they do, they document the work uh, they were in the regions that, that Marcus has just been showing the images about uh, last summer and fall as well, and sort of laying the, the groundwork for the, the work that Marcus and, and print journalist Joe Bavier did. Uh, I'd like you know, Ida to talk about that. I'd just say that you know, I've been a, a journalist for going on 35 years, trying to be a good reporter, but uh, in terms of persistence and doggedness and, and, and meticulous attention to telling every story and getting the facts right, um, I don't hold a candle to what Ida's done. So I hope that you know, you'll let her share with you some of the work that she's been doing on this topic. Thank you. So what we do at Human Rights Watch is spend weeks at a time in these places that Marcus has photographed, interviewing hundreds and hundreds of victims and witnesses to these attacks and trying to document in detail exactly what happened, what these people have lived through, who was responsible for these attacks, and then we share their stories with the outside world. I'd like to give you an example of just one of the attacks, one of the worst attacks we've documented in the LRA area. About almost exactly one year ago today, we heard rumors that there was an attack by the LRA in the Makombo area of Northern Congo. There was no clear information about what happened, when exactly the attack was. They said sometime before Christmas 2009, but they didn't know, no one knew exactly which villages, how many people were killed or abducted. So what we did is we went to, this, to the region and we got on motorcycles with local human rights activists and traveled to the area. And what we discovered was that in a series of well-coordinated planned attacks, a group of just 20 LRA combatants massacred over 345 civilians and abducted another 250 civilians, mostly children aged 10 to 15, in just a four-day period. They went village to village to village in a 100-kilometer round path that they took through the forest of this Makombo area of, of northern Congo. And in each village, village, they were looking for schools and churches and markets where people were gathered together, so where it, was, where it was easy to find people in groups. And then they would gather around these people and tie them up in chains of 10 to 12 people, and then load them up with looted goods that they took from the village and march them into the forest. Once they got into the forest out of the village, they started killing off their abductees targeting especially those who appeared tired or weak or who tried to escape, who seemed difficult or just were deemed unuseful to the LRA. Most of the victims were chopped to death with heavy wooden sticks and had their skulls crushed. Others were tied to trees before the LRA sliced the back of their head with axes, making an X mark on the, the top of the head. Um, when we 
traveled through this area by, by motorcycle just several weeks after the attack. The stench of death was still in the air, and local activists and Red Cross workers were still discovering bodies that, that had not yet been buried. Um, when these attacks happened, the, the villages ahead of the last attack, they had no idea that, a, that another village, maybe five kilometers away from them, had been attacked. And this is because the area is so remote. There aren't cell phones in this area. There's no cell phone networks. People don't have um, th satellite phones or ways of communicating. Um, and it's really remote. There aren't roads. Most people just walk. Um, so you were able to have 345 people killed in four days, and nobody talked about it. Nobody in the outside world knew this happened for, for weeks, month, even months at a time before it was published and out there. The, the people responsible for the Macombo massacre are, are still at large. They're still out there in northern Congo and in Central African Republic and in South Sudan, and they're still committing atrocities. Um, I'd like to give you a more recent example of an attack in a, a village called Duru in northern Congo, just south of the border with Sudan. Uh, and the LRA attacked this village when I happened to be there in late August. Um, and it was in the, the late afternoon around 5 p.m., just about half, half an hour after I, I arrived in Duru. Um, and I'd found a place to spend the night in the local church there. Um, and then around 5.30, the LRA came in. It was just a group of about five or six of them. And they crossed the main road into town and attacked four houses on the, on the outskirts of town, just half a kilometer from a UN peacekeeping base, one of the largest Ugandan army military bases in the region, as well as a Congolese army base. But the LRA group came in silently, they looted the goods of these four homes, and they abducted eight civilians, including three young children. They then marched them into, marched them into the forest about two kilometers, and there they had all of their abductees work all night, shelling peanuts and pounding rice that they had looted in the village. And then just after midnight, they killed three of the young men they had abducted by slicing them to death with machete. Early in the morning, they released a young woman and a 16-year-old girl they'd, they'd abducted, and they, they sent them back to Duru. I met them the next morning when they arrived in Duru, and they told me that they'd been given a message for the Congolese army, that the LRA was nearby and they'd be back soon. The, the girl and the woman then led the Ugandan and Congolese armies, the soldiers, to the site where the three young men had been killed, to, to bring their bodies back to Duru and also to try to try to track the LRA and see, see where that group had gone. Um, I watched later that afternoon as the bodies were carried back to Duru on stretchers, covered in blood with machete cuts all across their, their stomachs and chests and faces, the top of the head, ears sliced off, and surrounded by, by devastated family members and neighbors. Um, I just want to show you a short clip of, of what, what I saw when, when these bodies were, back, were brought back to Duru. They wanted to know why the international community wasn't doing more to help bring an end to this this brutality and help them return to their to their normal lives so they don't have to keep living each day in fear of the next attack, which is what people in Duru do and across this region of northern Congo and Central Africa and South Sudan. Even with the UN peacekeeping base nearby, even with Congolese or Ugandan army soldiers, that doesn't necessarily protect them, and they don't know when their village will be targeted. Thanks.